It's great to be with you. Um, yeah, I think I, last time you were in a school, right, Matt? Yeah, I asked Danielle to say what she said, but also that Matt was seriously one of, one of genuinely my best students, uh, a teaching assistant and, um, and someone that I regularly quote. I, have you preached on Irenaeus yet? Okay, yeah, all right, there you go. So when, when it comes in church history to Irenaeus, uh, Matt is my go-to, and so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, I'm not talking about Irenaeus today, but um, that's because, you know, I would be too ashamed to do so in Matt's presence, but um, it is really lovely to be with you. And um, to talk about uh, Luke chapter 14 and a, a section of that that... Um, is, is, is a, a, a wonderful section to root kind of our mission and what our mission is as a church and what that looks like. So um, we're going to look at one of Jesus' parables, um, God's invitation to the great banquet. Now, when I was growing up, banquet was the name of a TV dinner. Um, I'm still not sure I know what Salisbury steak is. Um, I, I can say that if you ever go to England, make sure you go to Salisbury Cathedral, but Salisbury steak is still a mystery. Um, the word banquet itself doesn't always stir up the best of connotations, however. At best, we go to a banquet to honor someone. But at worst, a banquet can simply be a camouflage for a long and boring speech. Uh, you have to feel somewhat sorry for Prince Andrew in this picture. Uh, mostly uh, because the photographer caught him in such an undignified pose. So today, when in our text, which we'll look at here in just a second, Jesus talks about someone who threw a great banquet. Uh, we may not be able to see it for what it was. In our day, perhaps the best example of a great banquet is the wedding reception. Um, a quick Google search reveals uh, that the average American wedding reception today costs over $23,000. That's the average. Coming out of uh, uh, the pandemic, the big wedding reception is back. Uh, where else can you see a cake taller than you are? Where else do 80-year-olds and 8-year-olds dance together? Where do you find chocolate fountains and fancy ice cre creations with little shrimp hanging from them? Maybe cruises. But other than wedding, sh we wedding receptions and cruises. So let's take a look at the text. Let's take a look at the text. From Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 16. Then Jesus said to them, someone gave a great dinner and invited at the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, sir, what you have ordered has been done and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come to come in so that my house may be filled, for I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. The whole setting for this parable is interesting. And I know you've been looking at chapters 14 and 15. Um, in, earlier in the chapter 14, we, we learned that Jesus is eating at the, ha at the home of a, Pharisee, of a prominent Pharisee. He has already healed a man on the Sabbath. He has already warned the guests against taking the best seats at the table, advised them to humbly take the, the less distinguished seats so that the host can honor them by moving them up the seating chart. And Jesus has already counseled them against inviting their relatives or wealthy neighbors to a party because they'll just pay them back. Instead, Jesus said to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, people who can't pay them back. 
And that's the context for our passage this morning. So let's unpack this parable, see what it might have to say to us. It begins by saying, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. But with parables like these, it's best not to overinterpret them. Let the basic message come through. The someone in this story is God. And God throws a party. God throws a celebration. Um, this image of God may be surprising to many of us, especially growing up. Um, uh, we, we tend to think of God kind of a cosmic police officer, ready to slap the cuffs on us in a mo- slightest vi- violation. God is a big, mean boss you couldn't please no matter how much you sacrificed. And while we may believe that God is merciful and loving, that doesn't always translate into a God that throws parties. So this parable starts by telling us that God is like someone who invites people to this great feast. We tend to underestimate the importance of celebrations and feasts for the people of God. The religious life of the Jewish people revolved around seven feasts every year. From Genesis, where Adam and Eve are told to eat from the food of the garden, to Revelation, where the angel says, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Feasting and banquets are everywhere in the Bible. Jesus loved parties, big blowout banquets. Jesus thought of his kingdom in terms of a feast. And in our parable, God doesn't just throw a banquet or a dinner. God throws a great banquet, a great dinner. And the word for great is mega. God throws a mega party. When we think of the kingdom of God, it begins with an over-the-top, gracious, generous God. And this God has invited many guests. Now, in Jesus' culture... When a mega banquet was thrown, it was common to send out two invitations. Quite a while in advance, one invitation would go out to the invited guests, telling them that a mega party was coming. But the exact date and the exact time wasn't announced. And then when the day came and the fatted calf was killed and the wine and the food were all prepared, servants would go out and tell guests that everything was now ready. To accept the invitation, ahead of time, and then not show up for the party was a huge insult to the host. So the text tells us that they alike began to make excuses. The Toronto Sun gave a number of excuses that people actually write on their insurance forms explaining how they got into accidents. These are not made up. Leaving home early for work, I drove out of my driveway straight into a bus. The bus was five minutes early. An invisible car came out of nowhere, struck my vehicle, and vanished. I collided with a stationary truck coming the other way. I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. (laughs) I had been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. With this one, it's debatable whether a toilet, a mechanic, or an English teacher would be the best solution. I was on the way to the doctor with rear-end trouble when my universal joint gave way, causing me to have an accident. (laughs) Excuses can be funny things. I'm sure we've heard or made up a million of them. You know, and and in our parable, the excuses don't actually seem all that bad. One guy has bought a field. He had to inspect it before the deal was completed. Same with the man who had purchased five team of oxen. Those animals would have to be tested before the arrangements could be made. And the last guy had just gotten married. And he couldn't be 
you know, he had a two-person party that he had to attend. The final invitation had just come at the wrong time. It would interfere with their work, their possessions, their relationships, their other concerns. They had other priorities in their lives. And going to this party just wasn't high on their list, even if it was a mega party. It seems to us that they just made choices. But in Middle Eastern culture, to turn down that kind of an invitation was to dishonor the one who gave it. It was to say that they no longer held the host in high esteem. It was a slap in the face. In the story of the prodigal son, when the elder brother refused to come to his younger brother's party, he wasn't just dishonoring the brother, he was dishonoring the father who had thrown the party. So let's be clear. Jesus is not saying that God will not accept lame excuses for rejecting the invitation. Jesus is saying that God will not accept any excuses, no matter how legitimate they might seem. Jesus is saying that God wants everyone at his party, and if you don't come, it wasn't because you weren't invited. So how does God, this mega party thrower, respond to those who snub his invitation? The text says, then the owner of the house became angry. Notice, first of all, that the owner of the house, God, becomes angry. Even though this parable is about a generous God who gives mega banquets and issues invitations to everyone everywhere, there is still within it this more serious tone. This is more than a voluntary op opportunity to have some fun. For, this God, for God, this invitation is vitally important. God is merciful and full of grace to everyone. But if you refuse his invitation to the banquet, you won't taste of the life that is abundant and life-giving and full of joy. But the good news is that we are invited. We are invited. The parable says, Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. When Jesus first spoke these words, the people at the Pharisees' table knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying that God had come to the people of Israel through the prophets, through Jesus. And if they would not respond to God's invitation, then God would take the invitation out into the streets and the alleys to the tax collectors, the sinners, the Gentiles. Jesus is saying that no matter who you are, no matter what you have done, no matter how many times you have fallen short, there is room for you at God's banquet. The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame were those considered unworthy to be at God's table. But God says that they were welcome. And it says, and if God says they're welcome, then it doesn't matter what anyone else says. But going out onto the streets and the alleys wasn't enough. The, sermon report, the servant reports that after going back out there, there was still room at the great banquet. So the master told his servant, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. Now the master expands his invitation to the roads and the country lanes. And this banquet is so wonderful, so abundant, that the owner tells the servant to compel people to come in. This doesn't mean that we are to manipulate people. It simply means that the party is so incredible so filled with laughter and joy, so transforming that God doesn't want anyone to miss it. So what does this parable mean to you, to me, to St. Thomas? Uh, there's two words that I hope to, to, that you to take, we can take away from this morning. As, uh, just briefly, let me flush them out. Here's how the great preacher Peter Marshall described the banquet. The poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame are feasting and laughing and celebrating and enjoying God's grace and undeserved goodness. And the master looks into the eyes of those who ex have accepted his invitation, have eaten his food and drunk his wine, 
and the master sees eyes filled with gratitude and with love. And God says, with gratitude like this, with love like this, why would I ever invite anyone other than those who are poor and crippled and blind and lame and broken and hurting? Those who are well-fed have no need of a banquet and their hearts remain ungrateful. Those who are hungry and thirsty know what it means to feast and their hearts are filled with gratitude. Do we see ourselves in this parable? Do we realize that we are invited to a great banquet? Do we realize that we are the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, the broken, the marginalized? Do we even realize that maybe we're the ones making excuses? Have we become so familiar with it all that we take the invitation of God for granted? Have we lost sight of our brokenness so that We've forgotten the wonder of God's love and forgiveness and unconditional acceptance. Friends, have we somehow forgotten to be grateful? So the first thing I want us to remember today is gratitude. Before we can even hear the second word, we need to stop at gratitude. We need to remember that we are broken and poor. And that God has invited us and that we have tasted of his forgiveness and and of this feast. Gratitude makes us aware that we are forgiven and we are loved. Gratitude moves us more than anything else to lead generous lives. When we recognize that life is a gift from a generous, inviting, forgiving God, We are overwhelmed with gratitude, and we want to live lives that are generous and loving. So our first idea from this parable is to remember to be grateful. The parable also makes clear at least one other thing, and talking to Matt, I know that this actually lies at the heart of who you are at St. Thomas. As a church, St. Thomas wants to create a place of welcome and invitation for everybody no matter who they are, you want people to feel welcome and like they have come home. But it isn't just a matter of welcoming people. Twice in our parable, the master tells the servant to go, to go into the streets and alleys, to go into the roads and country lanes. The second thought to take away from the parable today is that God calls us not just to create a welcoming place and expect people to come, But God calls us to go in compassion where the poor and broken and forgotten are. Why? Because God is inviting them to nothing less than a feast, a banquet of love and acceptance and forgiveness. We cannot just put out the welcome mat of hospitality. We are also called to be a church of mission where we go out into the streets and alleys and roads and country lanes. But when we talk about going out in mission to the poor and the broken and the hurting, we need to be careful about the spirit in which we go. It can be all too easy to take on a spirit of pride and exclusivity, a spirit that says we've tasted of the richness of the banquet and all of you other poor folk haven't. We have something you don't have. Isn't that great? And we forget that we are still the poor and the broken and the hurting. We forget gratitude. We forget humility. The late Catholic activist Virgilio Elizondo said, the role of the powerless is to evangelize the powerful. As we go into the streets and alleys and roads and country lanes, and we meet the people there in love and humility and gratitude, we are changed. We are evangelized. One person has wisely said that mission is one beggar showing another where to find bread. God has prepared a banquet for everyone. Out of gratitude, out of gratitude, let us go out in mission and discover alongside those who share our common humanity how good God is, 
And how generous is God's invitation to the table, to the banquet. Let's pray. Loving God, generous God, forgiving God. Um, give all of us hearts that are rooted in gratitude. That, um, and that, that as we go, as we go out into our world and mission, we can carry with us um, that sense of gratitude and humility and generosity as we invite others to your great banquet. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.